back to the Hope to Hope Conference. I'm Kim White with the My Sexy Business Team. And I'm Connie Myers with the Crystalline Moment Success Movement and, excuse me, Publishing. We are here, um, we are just enjoying this conference so much because we are privileged. Very. We get to be on and ask all the questions we want to ask to all these amazing speakers. And I will tell you, if you're not on and asking questions, you're missing out. Because oh, boy. They're being... We learned a lot, you know, mm -hmm. just in the last day and not even a day and a half yet. I mean, yes. It's amazing. We, um, we think it's awesome that these speakers have given you access to them by coming on and allowing us to do a Facebook Live. Because, you know, a lot of times you can't do that. You can just have a speaker who will... we got to spend lots of money yeah <laughs> to go see hear these people speak and you got to and 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 this was our gift and and um so if you are not asking questions you need to ask questions and you certainly need to tune in because it's very valuable information that we're receiving from everybody yes and i have been stoked ever since i got the the answer back that this next speaker was willing to be on because when we met I was so impacted by some of the things that he was saying that I have not forgot. I've told, I don't even know how many people about him and I get tickled because I think at first he didn't know whether I was just a stalker or, <laughs> <laughs> or just what, but our next guest is Gary foot. He is a, and I won't say the name of the town, right? But he is a California realtor, but he has a heart for personal development especially for men and you want to tune in and hear everything he has to say because he has a free gift for everybody at the end so welcome gary i'm so glad you said yes thank you so much ladies i'm so excited to be here you know when i got the invitation and i saw the name of the conference i just knew that i had to say yes <laughs> and <laughs> the reason for me is i love truth you know, if someone that said, Gary, describe yourself in one succinct statement, I would say that I'm a truth seeker. And that's something that's really important to me. And one way that that's evolved for me throughout my life is I studied theology and philosophy in college and went on for graduate studies as well. And people would always say, wait, theology and philosophy, don't those contradict each other? And I said, not if you're looking for truth. And one of the things that I learned in my studies was about hope. And I had a real misunderstanding about hope where I think oftentimes in our society, hope is said as, well, I hope I might win the lottery. I hope that this person might say yes to my invitation to date me. <laughs> I hope these various things. And really what you're saying in those moments are, well, there's a chance, maybe, maybe not. But what I learned is that hope is a certain thing but we just haven't realized how exactly it's gonna unfold yet. And so I love the name of the conference. I love the invitation that we're here to hope for hope. So whether you're a religious and spiritual person or not, I think we can all appreciate that definition of hope is there. We just may not have attained it quite yet. I love that, Gary, that, that's, that's phenomenal. I love that. I'm writing it down in case you wonder. <laughs> we both are. <laughs> Note taken. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, when we met, um, we were both striving, I will say, to to be better leaders, to um, to learn skills, to to be better at everything we did business wise and personal. And you know, you have taken that to an extreme level, I must say. In a very short period of time, you have really done a lot of things. You have gotten, um, and I, I just have to brag. I'm, I hope like this is okay to say this stuff, but you know, I look at you and I think your average time for selling a property is three days, not thirty or three months, or it's three, three days. Explain that phenomenon. <laughs> sure. You know, I, I think that the number one reason why I have such a high success rate, particularly in, in real estate and as a listing agent, 
is because of preparation. And I think that holds true for every area of our life. You know, if you've ever been on a website like Zillow or Trulia and you're looking at homes, you can see a home that somebody took a picture of with their iPhone. And then all of a sudden you're like, well, there's the front of the house. There's one of the toilets and a sink and there's the backyard. Okay. That doesn't really give me a good idea of what's going on here. Well, I go in with my photography team. We fly a drone over the house. We do videos. We have at least 40 pictures that we put up. And then I plaster that listing to over 900 websites with all that information. And so I'm getting people from overseas. I'm getting people from other states. I'm getting people from you know distances away coming to look at the properties that I have and getting multiple offers on them within a short period of time. And it's really because of that preparation and that exposure that I'm providing. And I think that that's true of anything that you do in life is that what's the preparation? What am I doing in this moment? How do I see this as an opportunity for me to know what I'm going to be up against next? And I think, again, that goes right back to the hope for hope. It was like, here, here we are in, in that hope. Like, what am I doing now? How does this present moment really prepare me for what's coming up? And I tell all of my sellers this, and they look at me a little bit strange when we first meet. I said, I just want to make sure that you're 100% sure that you want to sell your home because it's going to happen fast and furious. <laughs> and they usually just look at me and oh, say, maybe, maybe not. And then oftentimes they come back and say, holy cow, like, are we really going to be selling our house in the next 30 days now that we're in escrow? I said, yes, you are. So I warned you. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. That's fantastic, Gary. I know I know a lot of realtors in California, and that, that's saying something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's. Um, I think there might be more people that have real estate license than driver's license in California. So there's a lot of us here. <laughs> yeah, that you might be right about that. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, tell us more about um, what got you started. Like this is about giving people hope and and encouragement and, and helping them know that they can do things that they don't think they can do right now. So sure. tell us some of your story. Well, for 15 years prior to getting into real estate, uh, I had worked as both a youth pastor and a motivational speaker to high school, middle school, and college students. And so I was traveling the country routinely and speaking at universities and high schools and middle schools, trying to bring a message of hope. And the number one underlying part of my message was trying to help these young people understand that Choice is so powerful that none of us are a victim of our circumstances. Things might happen to us, but then we have to change those from this happened to me to this happened for me. And when that shift starts of this happens for me, then that's when life really starts to change because say, okay, these are the struggles that I faced, but now how can I use them to my advantage? Uh, I heard a talk years ago by Tony Robbins, and one of the things that really stuck out to me from this particular talk was he said, you need to blame the people for the good as well as for the bad. And said, so, you know, oftentimes like, oh, this is someone's fault for this, that, and the other thing. But the example that he gave is that, you know, I grew up in extreme poverty, and I blame my parents for that poverty that I grew up in because now – since I know poverty, then I know how to get people out of it and I can help them and provide specifically food for them. And that really hit home in a lot of ways with what I was doing as well, saying, how are we going to go ahead and look at not being a victim, but moving forward? So that was something that was really important to me. And as I started speaking more and more uh, across the country to middle schools and high schools, I started having the adults say, hey, can you stick around and speak to us and give, <laughs> give us some strategies on how we can live our lives better. So that um, kind of morphed a little bit into doing parent sessions in the evening when I was doing um, youth sessions during the day. So I'd, I'd travel somewhere and work in the high school or in the college, and then I'd have parents come in the evening and I'd work with them or work with uh, faculty and staff members. And at one of those particular instances, uh, I was in the Pennsylvania, um, one of the directors that had invited me came and spoke to me and said, hey, I host a conference for men, and we would love to have you come see you at that conference. Would you be willing to do that this summer? And I thought to myself for a second, and this is what you'll hear amongst a lot of um, youth speakers, you have this thought in the back of your head of, 
well, I don't really talk to adults, <laughs> and which is kind of funny. I don't really talk to adults. So that was running through the back of my mind because of the circle of people that I've surrounded myself with that were just phenomenal at connecting with young people. And I thought, ah, you know what? What the heck? If I can try to bring encouragement, hope, direction to these men, then I'll go ahead and do that. But little did I know that that would absolutely change my life uh, immediately, negatively, and then eventually positively. And that's why I wanted to share this particular story. So I was traveling out to speak to this conference. I was ready to go. It was June 12, 2015. Um, and I flew from California to Chicago. And I was really excited because in Chicago, I had a two-hour layover. And I was determined to figure out how to get my favorite Chicago pizza place to deliver to the airport and get it through security in that two-hour layover. Now, the important part of the story is that I made that happen. <laughs> so, I did get my pizza, and I ran back through baggage, or through security, made it in time to my flight, and I was really excited. But I got back with my pizza, and we we're looking at the monitor, you know, getting ready for our flight, and it says delay, 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 and I'm thinking, oh, gosh, this isn't good. There was this huge storm that was going through um, Pittsburgh area, which I was going to be flying into. And there was debate on whether or not the plane would be able to take off. So I didn't think I was going to make it to my conference. And then in the last five minutes before the gate was supposed to close and we were going to miss our window, they said, okay, pilots decided the storm's going to be okay. Get, get on the plane. Let's go. So, you know, all a couple hundred of us get on the plane. It was just a, a normal commercial plane. And we, we take off. Everything's good. But then about one hour into the flight, the plane um, starts shaking worse than I've ever had a plane shake before. And over the intercom, the pilot says, everyone take your seats and embrace. And I don't know if you've seen the movie um, Soli that came out not too long ago about you know the, the crash on the Hudson. And, but that scene was very real to me in that moment where we had to get down, hold our seats in front of us, and we didn't know what was going to happen. I reached for my cell phone and text my wife, I love you, because I thought that was the last text that I was going to get out, and tried to send it. It didn't send. The flight attendants were hunkered down as well, and that's how you know when something's going south. So when the flight attendants are white as ghosts, then you're in trouble. <laughs> so, you know, normally on a plane, when you have turbulence, you might go sideways a little bit. Well, the nose of the plane went up, the tail went down, and then we went this way, and then we got turned back and forth and back and forth and people were screaming and crying and, and praying out loud. And, you know, there were some things that we might get flagged on Facebook for saying, if I repeated some of the other words that were coming out of people's mouths, uh, <laughs> <laughs> but needless to say, there was fear and we landed and I thought I was having a heart attack and so did everyone else. We just all sat there on the plane. Just <sighs> so I went I uh, got my rental car, I drove, I spoke at the conference, it went really well. I had men lining up to speak to me for about an hour on individual issues that I helped coach them through. Then I uh, spent the night, got on the plane, then, and came back home. And things were a little bit apprehensive for me in coming home, but I thought it would be, you know, okay. I got home, went to sleep, because it was late that night, and the next day we we're going to celebrate my son's first birthday, my third child. So we got up early, we had gone to church. We went to breakfast, and while we were at breakfast, I took my middle son to the bathroom, and while I was in the bathroom, I looked up, and my chest started feeling really tight. I was like, gosh, what, what's happening? And then my heart started racing, and I felt like I was gonna, having a heart attack. So I walked out, and I told my wife, something's not right. I don't know what's going on. I said, well, just sit down, take a breath. I think you'll be okay. So okay. So I sat down and started you know, taking a breath, drank some more water, and I wasn't okay. And said, I need to go to the hospital now. So I went to the hospital. They thought I was having a heart attack. They ran me through all the tests. And the good news was that my heart was okay. The bad news was that they didn't know what was wrong. They thought I was just dehydrated. So they put a couple of bags of fluid in, sent me home. And they also gave me an anti-anxiety med that I had never been on before. I never had had anxiety. And so I took it and things got worse. And so oh. they got horrifically worse over the next period of days. I couldn't get out of bed. I couldn't drive. You know, here I was the strong man that was traveling across the country speaking at all these different places and I couldn't do anything. And I was fearful for my life. So I went back to the doctors and their solution was let's increase the medicine. And I said, 
Uh, I don't think so. Uh, this is worse. So I found a new doctor, and the doctor that I found, I'm so grateful for him. He had said, the problem is you have PTSD, and they put you on medicine that absolutely distorts PTSD and makes it worse, and that's why you weren't getting better. And so now I was in a battle for my mental health. You know, I had my wife, I had my three kids, and I had a lot to fight for. I couldn't drive. I got on a plane to go speak one more time, and I ended up getting um, so sick while I was there that at the end of this um, speech, I had about a thousand high school students. I told them to close their eyes so I could lead them through a guided meditation while I just laid on top of the podium <laughs> to hold myself up and made the speech, finish it off. They thought it was great, but I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna pass out. So I started working with different doctors and really did a deep search within myself to figure out what was going on. I lost 70 pounds during that experience. So I, I made the decision that I had a life worth living and I needed to be there and be present for my children, for my wife and for others in the world. And so it was a long, long battle for about 10 or 11 months. And I tried a whole bunch of different therapies. Some worked, some didn't. And in the end, when I went to go see the, the doctor that had diagnosed me with PTSD, he said, I would never diagnose you with PTSD anymore. You're not the same person. You did more work than anyone that I've ever worked with before. And he's like, I can't believe the incredible progress. And so in that moment, I had to look deep. And one of the people that I went to who was, um, just a really wise kind of spiritual healer, if you will. And we sat and we talked and said, Gary, let me ask you a question. I said, sure. He said, what would it be worth if I could connect you with someone that's been through everything that you've been through, but has made it out on the other side? And I looked at it and said, I would love to talk to that person. I would love to have help. I would love to be mentored. Please, you know, can you connect me with that person? And he looked at me and said, well, the bad news is I don't know anyone. <laughs> and he said, the good news is I think that may be who you're called to be as you move forward and bring in hope and direction to other people. And at the time, I wasn't in a place to hear it because I was still going through the healing myself and dealing with various things from um, my father had, my biological father was an alcoholic and drug user and he ended up committing suicide when I was in high school. And I had never dealt with his death. And then uh, I had another stepfather that was kind of mentally abusive growing up, and then he ended up becoming a wonderful grandfather, but not such a good father to me. And then um, over that course of that year of healing, so I was dealing with my father there. Unexpectedly, my grandfather ended up dying, and then a few months later, my stepdad, who had become my dad, died as well, all within this year period. So here I was dealing with all of these uh, masculinity challenges and trying to really find my place. And then these men that I was kind of looking to as anchors for me were all gone. So there was this void and I really had to dig deep and try to figure out what does it mean to be a modern man? And one of the things that I realized is that we've had this beautiful movement in the United States and in other parts of the world where we've been promoting women for the last 40 years in a positive way that was long overdue where women were able to contribute more in politics, in the workplace, in home. And so we had this movement that was happening, which is so necessary and beautiful, but at the same time, no one's come along and said, how do you adjust for men? Mm -hmm. If we look at the stereotypical understanding of a family, for example, let's say that there is you know, a husband and a wife, and a couple of kids. Well, you know, back in the, in the 40s and 50s, the husband went to work, he was the breadwinner, the wife stayed at home, was the nurturer. She took care of you know, all the children's needs. And that was the way that they contributed. She may have had other women in her life that were there. And that's where we have that saying of it takes a village to raise a child. So there was a community there. And that was the way of life. Well, now that you know, women are more active within the workforce and they're helping to contribute financially to families. And there's this shift of power in a certain sense of more equality, if you will, within the home. I think a lot of men are saying, well, does that mean that I should be having more interaction with my children than just financially? What does it mean that I need to be able to have a different relationship with my wife? Because now she's not having the social interaction that she that we were having a couple of decades ago, being in the workforce is more professional. So she comes home, she's ready to interact and to talk. But that was a model for me. I had no idea how to communicate to the, this woman that's in front of me. 
in a deeper way. So there's this huge void, and that's really what I'm trying to help men with, is saying, how do we identify those needs, and how can I coach you through those to become a better man? So that's... That's very powerful. <laughs> oh, that's very, very, very powerful. powerful. Very. Thank you for being there for, for that very reason. I, th I, th yeah. I think this is... Um, this is a very difficult time we're going through right now. And there needs to be more men out there helping other men. I mean, women can help, but uh, having other men be able to help other men, I think, mm -hmm. is, is extremely important and also extremely invaluable. So thank you for doing what you're doing. I appreciate that. You know, uh, last week, I had the opportunity to go to Las Vegas. And while I was there, I had uh, one of the gentlemen that I was with just took me out to dinner and we drove past the Mandalay Bay. And as we drove past Mandalay Bay and we, we passed by you know, the, the fields where so many people lost their lives and were injured, I had this horrendous realization as I was thinking about, gosh, there's so much death happening, so much violence and so many things that are, are wrong right now. And it hit me that almost all of these mass shootings have all been men. You don't see women involved, and it just struck me all of a sudden, like, oh, my gosh, there's this hurt amongst these men that haven't been able to get the help that they need. And it almost brought me to tears in that moment. And, you know, I was reflecting, but I was trying to be present to the gentleman that I was with, and so I didn't want to just burst out in tears and say, why? I can't believe this. And so I held it together, but when I got back to my hotel room, I was just haunted with that thought of so many Hurting men are, are hurting so many other people. So this needs to stop, and what can I do to help that? I, I think part of it is that because roles have are shifting and they're continuing to shift, and um, women have, you know, there's more and more. I forget the percentage. I just read something just a short time ago about the number of men now that are stay-at-home dads, and it's it's a it's a large number now. And the, the shifting of the roles has left, I think, a little bit of a void, or not a little bit of a void, a void. Um, in, uh, and, and there are is there has been a lot of help out for women to be, to step into their power. But that also means that men's roles are changing and they don't have the people out there supporting them with how that works. So if you take somebody like, you take a man from my generation uh, I'm I'm 69, so the older generation, their their manlyhood is much different than say my sons, who um, all of them share in the in the childhood raising, and they all share. It's not the husband making the money and the wife taking care of the kids, and I I think, um, but there's still this this perception right or wrong that men are are supposed to be strong they're supposed to be the ones that are not supposed to be vulnerable and um i, I think I, I really appreciate the fact of, of what you're trying to accomplish and the, and the things you're trying to do because um i think you're right i think that a lot of the conflict in these people that are doing all these horrible things a lot of it is an internal conflict about who they are mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that's one of the challenges, like you said, it's well, where do I fit into the, the bigger picture? And I think that there's also a question, like I started off with being a, a truth seeker that I've uh, really been trying to wrestle with myself. You know, I think that there is something of the masculine energy to strength, but what does strength really look like? Does strength mean that you're stoic or does strength mean that you are vulnerable? And I think that that's the problem is that we have a limited view of what this means. So it's we're we're living too you know too much within limits rather than living out strength to its fullness. Because if you think about the people, whether they're you know men or women, that you would identify as being extremely strong, oftentimes that moment where it shifts in our own mind of now I respect this person is when they've been fully vulnerable to you. And you're like, wow, I can't believe that this person has on A, B, or C are so truthful you know, with us right now. And that's something that's, I think, really necessary to see that this uh, idea of strength is much broader than 
the way that we've been defining it. Well, and you know, I, I appreciate your tender heart because we're actually in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. Um, and we were just at the, the memorial. memorial not very long ago. And it is, it, it is amazing to see the number of, you know, flowers and things that represent different people because we just can't comprehend unless we're there, how many people were impacted by that one incident mm -hmm. and multiply that all over the, really the world in incidents and how many does that add up to? I mean, because there's a lot of smaller incidents that don't get such news coverage, you know, mm -hmm. and, and you think about that and you're right. I mean, it's, it's mostly males that end up, you know, doing those kind of things. But the sad thing is, is what do we, what do we do even as women though? Because I do believe women are strong. I believe men are strong. I believe we 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 have roles to play, and I believe that that's defined personally. You know, it doesn't have to be defined by um, maybe society. Because I think it's awesome when dads are way more engaged with their kids, and they spend you know time whereas you know generations ago that wasn't really done. And so I think there are some good changes, but what can we as women, and this is not a women's conference, no. this is an everybody conference, <laughs> but what can we do as women to support men better? Because I think the shift has finally happened that men are supporting women in their roles. What can we do as women to support these men and help them, you know, grow up? grow up and the men that are grown, you know, what can we do to support? Absolutely. I think that's such a powerful question. You know, when I first started working with high school students in particular, people would always ask you, as I'm sure they ask you now, oh, well, what do you do for a living? What do you do? And I would say, oh, you know, I'm a, a youth speaker. Why, why do you spend time with teenagers? Like, they're, they're so awful and so bad and you know you might have a couple that are good here and there but why do you do that and i remember my response because i had worked with so many thousands of teenagers over the years i guess probably hundreds of thousands at this point but i had never met a bad team i had only met misguided teams misunderstood teams and teams that hadn't come into their own and when i'd say that to people say are you serious said, absolutely like, well, I have two high school kids. I said, give me 10 minutes and I can talk with them and be with them. And I'll tell you what's going on within their heart and their mind. And I really had this uncanny gift to be able to do that. If I could spend about 10 minutes with teens. It drove my wife nuts because there were times that we'd go out to dinner as a couple and I'd see teens. And I'd be like, I'll be right back. <laughs> and I'd go talk to them. And she'd be there by herself. So that wasn't the best uh, husband leave. <laughs> at times, but she's like, gosh, all right, well, at least I admire your heart for helping these young people out. <laughs> but I think that transitions also into working with men in particular of any age, you know, when you think about it, because I think that's one of the challenges that we see on the second part of that comment that I made of looking at all these mass attacks of violence being predominantly male, people say, oh, well, is that men being men or boys being boys? Is it of the masculine energy, if you will, to be violent? And mm -hmm. the answer is no, it's not. You know, the, the truth is that there's people that need to be able to help others to come and to know who they are. And I think to answer your question, the reason I give that little bit of a backstory is that it's important, I think, for men to be affirmed in their masculinity and to know that there's nothing wrong with their masculinity from women. So one of the things that my wife and I struggled with early on, we had a, a daughter first, and my oldest is a daughter, and, um, and then I have two boys after that. And so, you know, when my daughter was young, her favorite things to do were to sit and to read and to be read to or to do um, music interaction. She loved to do with music. And so we, we would do those things. And when my son got to be about, you know, one and a half, two, his favorite thing to do was punch or kick or try to bite you. <laughs> now, 
there's an appropriateness. <laughs> there's definitely an appropriateness to behaving correctly. You know, you shouldn't bite anyone for any reason. We could teach them that. But I remember my wife very specifically telling my son, like, don't hit. You know, don't hit. And, and, and he wasn't hitting out of being mean. He just had this energy that he needed to get out. He was just a little boy that needed to get there. And so we had to have a conversation where it was, oh, you can go ahead and you can go wrestle with dad. Like, don't hit your sister because we respect and we never put our hands on a woman. But if you feel like you need to tackle somebody or you need to get out some energy out, then, then go wrestle around with that. And he would. And I'd pick him up and I'd throw him, I'd, you know, tickle him a little bit. And, you know, I'd give him the opportunity to express himself as a little boy and not tell him that it was bad to have those type of needs for expression, but get them properly rooted. So my, my daughter's 11. My son will be eight on Sunday. And I'm really proud of them because this last summer they both uh, earned their black belts in martial arts. And that was wow. a way that I saw fit where we could get them involved in something where my, my daughter for self-defense and confidence, my son as a positive outlet for this, you know, aggression, if you will, that he wanted to, to feel. And so now we don't have those issues at all. And so I think that that's one of the important things is affirm masculinity, affirm these different areas within men, not say, oh, you're, you're so bad for A, B, C, and D, but say, you know, that's a positive thing. Now let's find a positive way for an outlet for you in that. That, that's, that makes a great point. And, and um, congratulations on your kids getting the black belts. My, uh, my granddaughter has her third degree black belt. She got her first one when she was 10. And I can tell you that um, I truly believe that every child should have an opportunity to do some kind of mixed martial art or some kind of martial arts because of what it teaches them both in confidence as well as what it teaches them in defense, uh, defending themselves, uh, and really respect. And the, I mean, there's so many really valuable tools that they learn uh, in martial arts that they don't always have the opportunity to learn outside of it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and, you know, I think one of the most important things that my kids have learned and is an important lesson for me as an adult is to not have shame of who you are. Wow. Wow. One of the things that they've learned, and <laughs> I'm, I'm running into a little bit of an issue with that now because part of that, there's absolutely no shame, and so it's not uncommon to have my eight-year-old walking around naked in around the house. I'm like, okay, this isn't appropriate. <laughs> I'm glad they come to but put some clothes on. <laughs> but it really is the exterior presence of that internal. There, there's no shame because... I have control of my body. I, I can see what my body is capable of. I can see a beauty within my body. And so now it's a matter of saying, okay, let's not get shamed into getting dressed, but at the same time have know that there's an appropriateness and prudence to, to wear clothes. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Oh. Well, I had boys, and I have to tell you, as a boy mama, I had to learn a lot of things about boys I early had, on. Mine were all boys, too. So <laughs> <laughs> We had to learn. Um, and, you know, I I read a book about, and it's called Wild at Heart. Yes. And uh -huh. it talks about, you know, a boy encouraging them to be themselves and encouraging them to take those risks that as a mom we're thinking you know please no <laughs> tmi tmi <laughs> my my now 27 year old um when he was three talked his older brother into taking his training wheels off and i never would have let him because i'm a girl <laughs> and i'm a mom and i didn't want him to be hurt but when yes. he took his training wheels off, I looked out the window. They were playing in the front yard. We lived way out in the country, and he was playing in the front yard. And I see him take off down through this little path in the woods and jump a creek. And <laughs> I mean, and this is at three with no training wheels. And you know, my mom mind and my female mind was, oh my, oh my goodness, you know. Mm -hmm. But it did wonders for his self confidence. It did wonders for him to be who he was, and it actually kept him out of trouble. It actually caused him to be able to do things on his bicycle. Yeah, that 
kept him from getting into mischief. Absolutely. So, I mean, and how old are your how old are your boys? One's eight. How old's the other? One will be eight, and then the other will be three. Or is three, excuse me. Yeah, eight and three. Wow. Wow. I can tell you that with my boys, um, I was a single mom while they were growing up. And um, they always challenged me. They were always like, um, and I was always worried about what the next thing they were going to try was. And <laughs> I had to have eyes in the back of my head because <laughs> I didn't have anybody to help me. But um, what's really interesting is they, I always taught them that they could do anything it is that they wanted to do and what the role they would be as a father, as a husband. And um, my, my youngest is 47. So they've, they've all turned into absolutely amazing men with incredible um, uh, personalities and, and um, what's the word I'm looking for? Values. Uh, that, so um, I think what you're doing and the things that you're out there have trying to help other youth with and other men with, um, that they may not have that kind of exposure um, is incredible. Absolutely. And, you know, I think one of the reasons, if, if I can be so bold as to say why you had such great success, you know, with your children is that you have to acknowledge who you are and who you aren't, you know, and I think that's one of the things that you really were able to do where you said, you know, and Kim, you said kind of the same thing on the same lines. I don't really understand why you need to do this. <laughs> I don't necessarily agree with it. And my gosh, it's not safe, so please don't die. You know, you're thinking these <laughs> Exactly. But I'm going to go ahead and honor that there's something within you and within the very being of who you are that needs to be expressed this way. And so now, even though I don't quite understand it, I'm going to support it. Yes. And I think that that's huge. Absolutely huge because I get a lot of um, single women and, and my mom raised myself and I have two brothers. So we had three boys in my family and uh, because of my, my dad's alcohol and drug addiction, he wasn't around very often. They, and they got divorced when I was about 10 years old. And so my mom raised my brothers and I oftentimes without any um, other man you know, in the home as in our early adolescence. So I can definitely relate and understand where you're coming from, from the, the child perspective. And I think that's one of the most important things is being able to say, okay, well, I think early on my mom tried to be all things. And when she tried to be all things, that's when we suffered. It was yeah. when she realized I have unique gifts as mom. And so I'm going to live to be the best mom that I can be. And then I'm going to go ahead and try to connect you with other people that can give you what you need that I can't. And that's where that you know, beauty really came in for our development. And so I think that that's something important where we're real with ourselves and be like, you know what? And I, I don't know this um, firsthand because obviously I'm, I'm not a mom, I'm a dad, but um, from my wife and from women that I've worked with, I understand that mom guilt is humongous for so many women that you have yeah. this mother guilt. And I think that part of that guilt is feeling, I need to be able to be the answer for everything. And yeah. The truth is, you don't. You just need to be the best version of who you are. Love that kid unconditionally and say, these are my limits, so let's find some other people to join our team. Absolutely. I was very I was very fortunate because both grandfathers were around and I had a brother. And, and so they played really important roles in helping to provide that male figure in my kids' lives. Um, but, but I totally relate to the mother's guilt. I don't know about you, oh, Kim, yeah. but, oh, yeah. but I, you know, I had, I had two jobs at least most of the time or three jobs. And I really felt guilty about the fact that I had to leave my kids alone. Um, and that we, there was, they all went to a different school every year except their junior, senior years. And I always felt guilty about that. But every single one of them, when they went off to college, called me to thank me because they said, they are not afraid to do anything. They're not afraid to go anywhere. They're not afraid to do anything. They know they can make new friends. They know they're going to be okay. And um, so I feel, I feel, um, I felt somewhat vindicated. Uh, mm -hmm. Not to say that I didn't still have a certain amount of guilt about not being there as much as I would have loved to have been. 
but they, you know, the fact that they've turned out to be such amazing yeah. men and provide for their families. And uh, I only, I have one son who has two daughters and then my other son just married a woman who has a boy and a girl and they are amazing, amazing dads. They're just amazing dads. I just love watching them and I'm just so proud of who they are. And, um, but I, 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 even that, there's still this little tinge of, of guilt that I wasn't there to be there like maybe some moms could be. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. Well, thank you for, for sharing. And thank you for the contribution to society at large. I think we forget sometimes how when we contribute good people to society, then we change society as a whole. So thank you for that. Well, I think it's awesome that there is a... Um, probably a movement, I'm not sure what to call it, but there is some um, waves in the water about not emasculating our young boys as moms, especially single moms, you know, not taking away that wildness, because that's exactly the, the risk taking. My boys found a lot of their, I think, manly um, affection and mainly, you know, outlets in football and mm -hmm. in sports. And I, I will forever be grateful for the coaches and the people that influence my boys in that way, because this princess is not a boy. <laughs> 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 and, you know, to, to even, to even to this day, um, my, my son was hurt in, football and had to have knee surgery and I asked him I said you know would you have changed it if you'd known you would have been hurt would you have changed all those years you played football and he said no and he hurts every time it turns cold or anything and he said you know no it was the best thing ever mm -hmm. and I look at him and I think that's absolutely boy <laughs> and girl is um, no, that's going to hurt. I'm not doing that. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think it's just a, it's, it's just an acknowledging, like you said, of the differences and being okay with it. I yeah. was okay for my boys to be boys. I didn't want to make them girls. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I think something that's really interesting too, and it goes all the way up to professional sports. If you're watching um, the major league baseball league or national football league or any of the basketball leagues, is that you think about, like you said earlier, about emasculation and trying to figure out, well, you know, where do men really fit? Or, well, you, you watch these things and say, so like, oh, well, you're not going to get more, quote unquote, manly than being an NFL player, for example. But then what happens for their celebration is they come together and they hug each other. Yeah. Like, isn't that interesting where you're saying, huh, you know, here, here we are and in this moment of, of triumph, or the same thing you watch at the end of the World Series, they all come together, they're jumping, they're hugging each other. You know, they're not out there punching each other in the face <laughs> in that moment or inflicting violence. Maybe there's some violence in football on the field, you know, as you're hitting each other. But even after that, you can even see opposing teams, they'll offer a hand and, and pull the other player up and give them a hug, give them a pat on the back, and then go back to their yeah. side to play. You know, the yeah. thing that we forget about that sometimes. I love yes. the fact that men find it okay today to show affection, to show hugs. Mm -hmm. And um, it just, it just warms my heart when that, when I see that, because um, you know, my, like my dad and even my, my husband when he was alive, I mean, he got to the point where he would hug his son, but he came from, he was an engineer and came from the construction industry. And that was just not something you did. And and for him then to reach the point where it was okay, I, I I think it's 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 such a wonderful thing, and it, it maybe uh, in some century in the future we'll actually get there. <laughs> Hope. 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 <laughs> <That's right. laughs> and thank you so much for all you've shared with us today. And you know we want to make sure that. We can get people connected to you because I know when we had our conversation before we started, you said you work with men and women, but you just, your heart is really for changing the world through changing men. And yes, I, I appreciate you for that because again, having sons, we want them to be yeah. who they are. And 
you know, the fact that you are helping give them permission to, to be the men that they are is amazing to me. So how can people get connected with you? How can they get um, in contact with Gary Foote and, you know, get some personal development and, and how can, how can we put you out there so that they can get you? Absolutely. Well, again, thank you so much for, for having me here. This has been an absolute blast for me to talk with you women. So thank you so much for being here and for putting this on. Um, something that I think most of your viewers will know is that this was um, a, um, a rain check <laughs> for the conference because there were issues. And I think that there's a beautiful lesson to all of us about your tenacity and saying this is important enough for us to figure out a way to make it happen because you're, you know that your viewers are important enough to be able to have this. So thank you so much for finding a way to make that happen. I think that, that speaks a lot of your character of who you are and how it is that you want to serve your audience. So I'm so thrilled to be able to be a part of that today. So thank you for that. But as far as um, how to reach out to me, you can reach out through Facebook if you like, you can reach out through email. Um, I'll even give you a phone number. And one of the things that I know for men is that a lot of times we're a little bit hesitant to try something new. <laughs> and so I offer um, free session, uh, one free session to any men that are interested in getting some coaching. And I'd be happy to offer that to your audience. So that's something that I can do for them. So there won't be any charge, no credit card up front, anything like that. Let's just meet, let's talk, let me learn about you. Let me be able to share a little bit about me and how I can help you. And if it's a good fit and we can continue to work together, then awesome. And if that one session was enough of what you needed, then that's wonderful too, because you're gonna go out and make a real positive difference in this world that needs you right now. So reach out to me on Facebook. Um, I look like this. <laughs> so you'll know that you have the right gear. <laughs> you search for me on Facebook, send me a message if you'd like. You can write on my wall. Uh, you can visit uh, my website. I have a few of them. It's livingforgreatness.com. So you can go there. You can call this phone number. It's 909-578-0272. And you can connect with me there so we can set up a time to talk. But any way that I'm able to serve you, I'm absolutely 100% committed to doing that. Mm, you are so amazing. And, you know, I, I have to tell you, you – you were privy to my meltdown over the whole thing that we couldn't have the conference when we had scheduled it. And you said some pretty profound things back to me that encouraged me to not give up because, you know, when you have something that major and you have all of these people, people counting on you to show up and then something like technology spanks you. <laughs> Big time. <laughs> It, it was devastating to me. And so I appreciate so much you encouraging me, you know, and and just sending me messages to, to be, you know, to don't give up, to don't be sad that God had a different plan. And I just appreciate you. I appreciate you more than you have any idea. Well, I appreciate you too. Um, you know, there's a, a famous saying of a rising tide lifts all boats. And I think that the more that we can work together and, you know, raise that tide so we can lift all the boats. <laughs> we, there's a lot of boat lifting to do, so let's work together. <laughs> yes, there is. <laughs> and we're strong. <laughs> but we're girls. <laughs> yeah, right. We need strong women, too. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much, Gary. And I encourage everybody that's listening, please get in contact with him and follow him on Facebook. And just see his amazing sauce <laughs> definitely definitely well thank you for coming to the hope to hope conference thank you for being a part of such amazing amazing speakers amazing people i'm kim white with the my sexy business team this is connie myers with the crystalline moment success movement in publishing and we will see you in the next session the next session will start at oh isn't that the one that uh no? Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> the next session will start in about 40 minutes. In about 40 minutes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Gary. You're welcome, <laughs> ladies. Thank you, audience. Take care.